Whereas in the North Sea, I don't think a diver has died of anything other than natural causes since the 80s, really. Okay, boys, taking you down now. Um, that single point failure is just technically not supposed to be able to happen. Explosive decompression and death. Even if Dave had been right in front of me there and then, it would have been, you know, fine margins to getting me back to the diving bell and my, my hat off in time. Chris Lemons, deep sea diver, unintentional star of the incredible documentary, if we can call it that, The Last Breath. What an honour to meet you, mate. No, the honour's all mine. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me along. It's very kind of you. Wow. I, it was in my head that I, I know you do public speaking, so I guess it's good to get yourself out there a bit on podcasts, but... Do, do you get a bit sort of fed up with all all this attention? Um, I, don't, I wouldn't say I get fed up with it. Um, I've always been a bit self-conscious of it, I think, because, um, you know, I'm sure we'll come on to the story in a minute, but, you know, uh, people often want to talk to me, which is lovely, and I, I'm quite happy to talk about it, but I always feel that the others involved in the story who probably des deserve uh, far more credit than I do, um, you know, the real heroes, if you like, often get sort of... Uh, yeah left out a little bit i guess so yeah i have a little bit of a guilt complex about that but other than that i'm very happy to, to talk to people about it yeah oh that's wonderful well <laughs> obviously for a podcast that's wonderful <laughs> um yes i mean i uh, when we said hello earlier i'm i'm full of emotion mate because oh gosh i uh, i think as a, a diver myself although obviously not to the, the standard that you've trained to but i've I don't, know that. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying though <laughs> folks we've got a humble man here and that is always a always a great start for a podcast but just honest <laughs> i am um, just a, a quick synopsis on on like why i this this moved me so much is I, i've done all the sport diving so i've dived in all the kind of exotic locations around the world when i dived in a wetsuit oh my god it was so easy you felt like the king of the sea. Yeah. When I when I went on expedition to Antarctica to dive, wow! I moved to a, a compressed neoprene dry suit. Yeah. Um, and then things got like considerably more technical. Even your rig was set up. You had to have a different. Um, um, let's just say valves on your equipment in case one froze, then you still had an emergency and all this. And yeah, we, even in the training, Chris, I started to struggle with the buoyant buoyancy thing. I know this is a different issue when you're on the bottom of the North sea, yeah. but I perforated an eardrum because I would, I, I was just really um, having problems going between the, the buoyancy jacket and the suit itself both of which you can put air into, right? So I was having problems there. We did our first dive in Antarctica, and on the very first dive, one of our team drowned. Drowned and um, died? Yeah. The, the, the Japanese girl was literally sat next to me in the, in the rib, as the, the sort of inflatable guys, as we were gearing up. And her and her dive buddy went off quite quickly, which was surprising because we were all just taking our time doing the buddy checks. Then an American uh, girl popped up upside down. So she had air in her legs, which yeah. is just an amateur, amateur thing. Right. Yeah. And in that confusion, um, the Japanese girl immediately had problems. So she was trying to grab hold of the rib. The dive master is trying to zoom over and, and rescue this girl. These guys, the, the water was just going over their face. And I think what happened is she'd lost her regulator. You know, she'd taken her regulator out. When she let go, she was uh, negatively buoyant. So she probably sank immediately. And then in the panic of yeah. trying to grab her regulator, mm. when what you should do is just ditch ditch your weight and obviously you're going to pop straight up 
um yeah she she, she died and um god that was uh horrendous horrendous yeah. yeah so so that was that and also i i went on a local dive here in in plymouth where i live with a couple of buddies and we just went down a rock wall and suddenly when the tide started dragging out it it really become uh like a safety issue you know we're just focusing coming up and i started to have a panic attack of all things which yeah. like yeah. i'm not prone to yeah yeah and what you don't want when you're 30 meters down and it and luckily my dive buddy was just yeah checking his computer and you know then we went up gradually but it that brought home the gosh just that bloody life and death thing about diving you know it it's only takes a little thing to go wrong mm. and then in addition to that of course there's a video on youtube of this is it the the blue hole in egypt yeah where there's this archway that some divers try and swim through but, but because it's so deep by the time they get through it they've yeah. run out of air yeah and then suddenly they become negatively buoyant because they've got no air to put in their suit, you know, into, into their BCD. Yeah. And they start to plummet. Yeah. And one of these guys that died had it all on film. So he's just going down yeah. and you can hear this gargled screaming as he's going down. And then you've got to watch him on the ocean floor. Very similar to your um, documentary where you're thinking, well, with, with this guy you know he he's dead yeah and, it, yeah. and it's all there on film so yeah. when i watched last breath i just think a culmination of all those things yeah you know just seeing you lying there and thinking oh god i mean i think you know when you watch a documentary you, it's it's got a good ending <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if people realise that with that film, because some people, I think, guess and some don't, that, you know, there's going to be a, well, for me anyway, a happy ending, yeah. But you're right, I mean, it's an emotional, it's a bit of an emotional rollercoaster anyway in a film, and, um, yeah, there's something about underwater, isn't there, that that touches us all in some ways. You know, it's a fear, isn't it? We all have a, you know, the truth be told, we've all got a fear of the darkness and, the, and you know, the unknown and the, yeah, and, and drowning and things like that, you know, it's, um, yeah. It's, I should it's, also add, sorry to be so... Uh, at all. To, put, to put all this on you but i went to a festival in portugal with my best mate lee and he he drowned on the first evening oh my goodness in the, in the lake that we were camped next to um sorry to hear that yeah that's horrendous and then you're you know i've said this before you're on a lake side with your mate's dead body at your feet and yeah and you've just got a you know it all just becomes very very real chris you know so yeah. So yeah, that's probably why I'm a bit emotionally yeah. invo involved in your in your story. Yeah, well, it sounds like you've got every reason to be. Yeah, that's um, that sounds very very tough. Yeah, I mean it's, it's I mean you, the, the thing is about our job is um, that the people always assume it's very dangerous, you know. Uh, but in a weird way, I think everything you described there, you know, with, certainly with the scuba accidents, you know, I think scuba diving is far more dangerous than than what I do. Uh, because all the, the inherent dangers, the principal dangers in diving are your ascent, you know, your a lack of control of buoyancy, basically, you know, which can, you know, with you as your ears, but obviously can cause decompression illnesses and things like that. And um, most of those sort of problems are taken out of the equation in the diving that I do, because, you know, for us, we're lowered down in the diving bell every day and, and back up and, you know, our, our ascent and descent are controlled very, very accurately by, you know, large teams of people. Um, so, you know, uncontrolled ascents, things like that, they don't really happen in the, the, you know, certainly in the commercial saturation diving world. So, um, the, the incidents and problems we have are all, are usually, um, working incidents, sort of construction injuries and things like that, you know, it's trapped fingers and dropping loads on people, that kind of stuff, you know, that, that's when people get hurt. It, they're not very often that they're diving related problems because that's so controlled, if you like, but as you said, when something does go wrong, you're in an environment where it's it's you know everything is exacerbated, isn't it? And uh, all the all all the problems are heightened because of where you are. Yeah. How did you get into saturation diving? Um, yeah, I, I 
I don't really have a, I wish I had a romantic story for this. I think I'd make one up really. Um, um, so Dave and, Dave and Duncan, who are in the film as well, they, they, um, they were both sort of passionate divers before they became commercial divers. Dave used to sort of teach scuba out in uh, Thailand and things like that. And I think Duncan mentions in the film, he was a sort of a Jacques Cousteau fan and that kind of thing. And they both found a way to make their, their passion, their vocation, I guess, you know, but for me, that wasn't really the case. I was, I was just, uh, I was quite young, uh, you know, about 20 and um, not really certain of where to go with my life really and what to do and a bit lost, truth be told. And um, uh, a friend's father just got me a summer job really working on the back deck of a, of a DSV, of a diving, a diving boat out in the North Sea, uh, just for a bit of pocket money really. And um, it, it gave me the opportunity to see, these guys working firsthand and um, yeah, that was great for me. That was, you know, I was how I found my calling, but it's, it gave me direction in life. And I decided that's what I wanted to do. They probably turned up in fancier cars than me on the key side as well, which helped, you know, if I'm totally honest, but uh, yeah, it was good ever since then it's been, you know, my life's had a bit of purpose and direction, which has, has been very good for me. It's um, uh, you know, I knew, I knew what I wanted to do and I, you know, I took the steps to, to get there basically. Yeah. So yeah, sorry. It's not a better story than that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm I'm sort of um a bit curious because obviously as an ex marine, I uh, it's a lot of it's something that a lot of servicemen go on to do, isn't it? Yeah, we've got a lot of a lot of ex marines, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, ex forces people in general um, in all the positions, not just the divers, amongst the divers, but um, you know on the boat in general, we've got you know people from from the RAF, a lot of the mechanics and that sort of thing, you know. So yeah, it's definitely. Um, I don't know why that is. I guess it's, uh, yeah, it's, people will see it as, a, you know, there's the same sort of sense of adventure, I guess, that you maybe had when you, you you know, the reasons you joined the Marines are probably similar to the reasons people go into something like diving, you know. It's a bit different, isn't it? And it's a bit of an adventure and uh, it's a challenge and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, it, it, the, the two suit and the temperament obviously suits as well, you know. Yeah, and I think the, the one thing about us Marines is we were always looking for a quick buck. Yeah, it was that as well, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it pays obviously can consider yeah. well yeah well i mean it's yeah it's an insecure lifestyle i guess you know you're not always very few of us are sort of permanently contracted if you like amongst divers it tends to be you know tends to make hay while the sunshine kind of work but yeah again that appeals often to to yeah ex forces people I, th- I think and um yeah they're, they're, most of them are very very good you know they're, they're sort of the training and so on suits well to, to what we do you know and you you often hear it referred to as is it the two most dangerous jobs in the world? One of them is something like Canadian lumberjack. The other one is deep sea diver. Is is that? I don't know how true that is. Yeah, I mean, I think I think in the UK it's probably fishing, isn't it, and stuff like that. I would think. Ah, uh, trawler work. Yes. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. But there is that's I'm sort of touching upon. There is this sort of little misconception. It all depends how it's managed. So if you. If you're a diver in the States, for example, um, it's just strange for such an advanced country. They're very, you know, they oh, this sounds a bit harsh, but they're a bit, bit behind in terms of the safety culture they have there. And they kill divers all the time, you know. Whereas in the North Sea, I don't think a diver has died of anything other than natural causes since the 80s, really. So, uh, you know, maybe not, maybe early 90s we lost one. But, um, you know, it's so regulated uh so I could you know I, I work on a boat with 110 people just just there really to put two divers on the seabed you know and everything is micromanaged and risk assessed and you know the same as every other workplace you know in the on the on the planet at the moment you know to, to a point where it's almost too much but it does it does has massively reduced the incidence of uh, certainly of deaths and, and injuries as well you know uh, for the better but yeah worldwide it's it's definitely a, p- a profession that potentially can be very very dangerous, you know, um, if it's mismanaged, you know, bad people in bad positions um, who are gung ho about things and who treat divers as uh, as cannon fodder, you know. Mm. Had yeah. had you had had any other scrapes before this one? Uh, no, nothing of that magnitude, really. No, I mean. Um, uh, yeah, I've been lucky. I've always worked in in good places. I think uh, as, 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 as you start off, I'm a sort of saturation diver now. But originally, you, you have to sort of do so many years as an air diver, and uh, so I worked off sort of the west coast of Africa and Brazil and <coughs> Middle East and places like that. Bless you. Excuse me. Not at all, no. Um, so yeah, you, I definitely in being worked in hairier places, but generally, I've worked for big companies where safety has been 
uh, paramount really um and you get to the point when you've worked in those situations you know that that becomes second nature to you and i wouldn't go anywhere and accept anything else now you know and i wouldn't accept it for anybody i was working with either you know just wouldn't put up with it but in the, in the infancy of your career you're you're less attuned to that you're more keen to make a buck like you say you know and uh, you'll do whatever you're told you don't know any better do you so uh i've i've had you know most of mine have been close misses with construction problems so i've had people nearly drop you know, cranes on me and things like that. Uh, you know, they've piled up on the seabed next to me. I haven't even noticed they've been there, you know. So I've had near misses of that nature. But, uh, yeah, certainly nothing of the um, of the magnitude of uh, what, what happened uh, to me in well, 2012 now, yeah. So talking of risk assessments then, um, so, so our friends at home, in, in my simplistic terms, the the computer system on the boat failed and therefore the navigation of the boat failed and it started drifting and it, um, just dragged Chris across the, the sea floor, at which point you couldn't go anymore because you came up against this construction. Um, and then obviously all your umbilical cords, so your heat, air, this kind of thing promptly snapped, leaving you with five minutes of air in your emergency bottle. Was there no risk assessment for, for this happening to a ship? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I suppose the short, I mean, we, we, so that position, that system is called a dynamic positioning system. And it's exactly as you described. It's a sort of a computer system, which has various sensors, beacons on the seabed and uh, taut wires, which uh, are sort of weighted wires, which give an angle of inclination back to the ship and GPS as well. Uh, yeah, and that feeds all this information back to a central computer, which then instructs the thrusters and propellers around the ship to, counteract the you know the effect of the wave and the winds and stuff and allows the ship to stay in one geographical position you know to within one or two meters of accuracy remarkable really you know in, in pretty bad weather um so we 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 are constantly aware aware that that system might fail to some extent um i don't think anybody had ever known one fail completely but yeah we are always we preach what we call umbilical management all the time so you need to be constantly wary of where your umbilical is because it's exactly as you described uh, you know and what it sounds like which is a giver of life basically everything you need to survive in that environment comes down a, a hose basically uh your yeah, gas to breathe and hot water to pump around your suit to keep you warm and uh power for your your camera and your light and all that kind of stuff so um yeah we everything we do when we're working particularly in in structures where that might be compromised uh, or if we're working uh, on rigs, for example, you know we're, we're always wary that your umbilical needs to be managed and you need to be free in the event of what we call a runoff, so the ship drifting away in a certain direction. It, so we do the, the complete failure of the system. I don't think there's anything, I mean, I, don't, I won't say we ever anticipated really, which sounds terrible. Um, uh, there are multiple, it's supposed to be, the ships are designed in many respects, so that there cannot be a single point failure. There's supposed to be backups to all of our systems. So that's our, our life support systems, like the hot water, like the gas, multiple redundancies. Uh, and the same with that dynamic positioning system. It has a, if the computer fails, then there's a backup computer and then there's another backup computer, you know. Um, that single point failure is just technically not supposed to be able to happen. But yeah, there's there's the very lesson in itself, isn't it? That it, it can and it did. They had a, a, an electrical fault which was there right from the point of installation, apparently, and uh, and it suffered a catastrophic failure. And as you say, everything on the bridge went black and dark, and they lost all their navigational screens. It was dark outside. We were we were working in open water, so they had no real. There was nothing for them to orientate themselves with. There wasn't a rig or anything like that. Um, you know, they just had black windows and black screens um yeah and the, and the ship basically was at the mercy of the wind and the waves at that point and started to drift away uh we on the seabed um we didn't really know exactly what was going on we have a sort of um a dive supervisor who talks in our ear all the time so he was just telling us to get ourselves out of the structure we could hear alarms and things um but it, we weren't panicking you know these kind of things happen so we we sort of made our way out of the structure we were working right inside the structure, so we made our way out with no problems and you know the bell. The, the the bell was the diving bell was supposed to be straight in front of us, um, with our umbilical sort of rooted safely towards it. Uh, and when we came out of the structure, it wasn't there, so we knew there was a, an issue. And our, our umbilicals, instead of being in front of us, were, were were wrapped back over the top of the structure we've been working within. So you 
you know, the, the thing is when you're diving uh, that depth, um, you've only got one safe haven. The, the diving bell is the only place you can go. The, the surface is never an option because your tissues are saturated with inert gases. It would be explosive decompression and death, you know, as a, for an absolute certainty. So you don't really have to think too much. There's only one place to go, and that's to follow your umbilical back to the diving bell. So that's what we, we both did. Um, but I, I had to climb my umbilical to be able to get to the top of the structure, and in doing so, I left a, a, a loop behind me. But because we, you know, we are always conscious of our umbilicals, you know, I turned straight away to try and to, to make sure it didn't catch on anything. But yeah, basically I was, too, I was too late and it had caught on this metal outcrop basically and, and stuck fast very, very quickly. The, I think the film sort of loops a bit of the footage. So it sort of belies how quickly it really happened. Uh, and it, you know, it was wedged under this, um, the loop was wedged under this uh, little metal outcrop and I effectively became uh, an anchor, you know, for an 8,000 tonne, vessel and there's only ever going to be only going to be one winner in that situation isn't there so yeah it was a strange moment so i remember at the time i, I don't think i was you know i didn't really compute what was happening you know you're too busy trying to save yourself and i, I remember being worried about the umbilical breaking particularly it didn't that didn't really cross my mind but it was sort of it was slipping around this tiny gap that it got caught in and i thought i'm going to get pulled through that you know that's going to be like a, a going through a cheese grater you know that's not going to be a pleasant ending and my legs were sort of splaying and I thought they're gonna they're, these are gonna break and yeah it was uh, uh scary moments definitely yeah <laughs> that's quite ironic that it's snapping which you'd think would be your worst nightmare to actually save your life yeah absolutely right um there's all sorts of things going to happen there my helmet could have been ripped off um yeah i could have been pulled through that gap uh, so yeah you're right the the fact that it stuck fully which it did eventually it stopped slipping w- was a good thing you're absolutely right and um yeah it sort of stretched and I, I lost my i lost my breathing gas before before the umbilical snapped i think the hose must have kinked or extended the point that um you know the gas couldn't pass down it anymore so um yeah, I had to turn out. You sort of touched on it there. We, we carry an emergency supply, so scuba bottles, basically, on our, on our back at the time. I had a twin set, so two seven-litre bottles, uh, which I turned on. And that, at the moment you're doing that, you're going from a world where you have, you know, an infinite supply of gas, essentially, uh, that comes from the boat. You could stay down there for days if you needed to, to a very finite supply. And, yeah, the film sort of makes out five minutes. But, you know, if you do the maths properly, the truth is probably more like about nine minutes, I think, depending on how quickly I breathed it. Um yeah, um, so you're you're on a clock then because you know after nine minutes you, you need to be back in a diving bell otherwise it's it's game over you know, um, and the yeah the umbilical continued to stretch and eventually eventually snapped um, um, with a you know like a, a shotgun and I fell backwards towards the seabed and found myself sort of like an upturned turtle in the most complete and utter, utter blackness yeah it was a scary moments definitely and in that moment. How did you feel? Uh, as in, was it just immediate, oh, my God, I'm dead? Or was it panic? Or was it, could you, were you able to stay calm? Uh, no, I won't lie to you and stay, I said calm. Uh, I was definitely panicking. Um, I don't remember thinking very much at all, to be honest. I think it's very much that, that fight or flight, isn't it? Um, adrenaline uh, rushes, I'm sure you've experienced in your, in your forces days at some point that, you know, it's... Um, I don't, I don't remember thinking anything at all, really. Just you're just purely there to to, to save yourself. Um, so I, as I said, you know, the only thing I'm thinking is of getting myself back to that to that diving bell. So um, my instinct was to to find my way upwards. So I sort of uh, I needed to find the the structure we've been working on. I thought I'll get onto the roof so I can see where the diving bell is and you know get myself back to it somehow. Don't really know how I was planning on doing that to be honest. Because I know my buoyancy was severed along with the. Um, with the umbilical, we don't we don't have a feed from our bailout bottles to we also to a uh, to our we sort of have like a stab jacket we wear to inflate if we do need to become buoyant. Um, but I sort of managed to scramble in the complete darkness. I was lucky to find a structure at all, really. I mean, I could easily have walked out in the other direction. It was complete potluck, really, like fumbling around for the toilet in the middle of the night, really. You know? mm. uh, bumped into it and I was able to climb up, but that was a sort of the seminal moment for me really was when I got to the top of the structure and I looked up fully expecting for some reason to see the the diving bell there or to see Dave or Duncan on their way back to, to fetch me and, you know, looked up and saw nothing but blackness above me and no sign of any lights or the lights of the diving bell or, any, or anything at all. And um, 
that was that had a that in its own way had a strangely calming effect. I, I found at that point, I think when not that I'd given up hope, but I'd sort of did the maths roughly and worked out that you know whatever gas I did have, I'd used quite a bit up just getting myself back up to the top. And even if Dave had been right in front of me there and then, it would have been you know fine margins to getting me back to the diving bell and my my hat off in time. And with nobody there, you you know you, I realised quite quickly that chances were pretty slim and you know if not non-existent and that that definitely had a, a strangely calming effect I don't know if that was a conscious one or a, a subconscious one a bit of both I think you know uh, I think I, I hadn't given up but I definitely resigned myself to what seemed like the inevitable and uh yeah and sort of the panic panic faded from me at that point and um it, uh, and I did try and regulate my breathing a bit to try and make what I did have last as long as possible. But um, yeah, I went from definitely transitioned from a sort of panicky survival mode to a, to one of resignation and what felt like grief, I think, you know, the, the strange luxury almost, if you like, of, of, of certainly thinking I was about to die and having a few minutes to, to think about it, you know. So friends at home, just trying to paint the picture. So the ship is basically out of control and it's wandered off its position. All the engineers are desperately trying to get the com- revive the computer so they can get back over to where Chris is. In the meantime, the ship is attached to the diving bell. The diving bell is attached to Chris and Dave. Dave, although he's being dragged, has managed to get back in the bell yeah. And the engineers are frantically not only watching Chris on the TV screen, um, must have all made the assumption this is game over. And it was it just to see you sort of moving like this on the bottom of the ocean was t- traumatic in it in itself. And this nine minutes that Chris talks about, they didn't recover the ship for what Chris about ha- half an hour. Yeah. So yeah, as you said, the boat the boat was about ended up being about two hundred and fifty meters away, and there's a sort of a snail trail of the, their efforts to bring it under control manually. It was the uh, the chief officer and the captain together. They had four joysticks that they had to try and control with no references. I said. So I mean, ultimately they were doing their best, and they but they they were unable to to regain control. The diving bell, as you said, is hanging underneath. Dave only has fifty meters of umbilical. So he's only able to get 50 metres away from the bell. So he obviously was unable to get anywhere near me. But what they did have was this, um, we have a remotely operated vehicle, um, which is like a flying camera, basically. It has a sort of a, a manipulator arm as well. And that has a 300 metre tether. So they were, able, they were able to get that back to me because initially they didn't know. They, they had no idea what had happened to me. They, they, they knew my umbilical had broken because they, they pulled in the, the other end into the bell. Um, but they didn't know whether I was alive, whether my hat had been ripped off or, or whatever. So, yeah, the footage you see in the film there, that slightly harrowing footage, is there. The, it comes across me um, I, I, at the point where I think I've already fallen unconscious, so I don't remember seeing the ROV or anything like that. Um, um, for me, it was, uh, yeah, a few minutes on, of, of sort of darkness on a seabed, <laughs> thinking to myself, and then eventually I pass into, into unconsciousness. And, uh, yeah, it took them... Basically, the point at which they regain control of the vessel, which they did by um, a solution we're all familiar with, which is they turned the computer off and turned it back on again. Um, the Norwegian crew, they call that the Swedish solution, apparently. <laughs> you don't know what you're doing, you just turn it on and off. Um, and they, uh, yeah, that was 40. I think by the time Dave was able to come and get me, I think 40 minutes had passed, 42 minutes, something like that. So, yeah, there's a sort of a you know, a 30 odd minute um, window where, uh, where I, I, we assume I had absolutely nothing to breathe, you know? So it's, um, yeah, it, it feels slightly miraculous. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. It means you'll never have to buy your own drinks ever again. If I bring the story out, definitely not. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's me. who should be buying them. Let's be honest. But yeah. <laughs> and well, yes. I mean, let's talk about Dave. Did, was his journey to get back into the bell, a straightforward one or was he getting dragged and yeah i mean he was in, he was in no small amount of danger himself you know he was being dragged you know uncontrolled by the, the the boat um he he's a very very fit guy dave um you know sort of rock climber type physique you know light sort of live and lightweight but very very fit and he really really struggled to get himself back uh 
He didn't actually get back into the bell. We have a little sort of holding stage underneath. So he got himself back to that. I think his umbilical was wrapped all around the bell. And, you know, he says, I think he says in the film, doesn't he, that, you know, by the time he was back on the on the stage, he was, you know, pretty much exhausted. And, um, uh, yeah, and, he, you know, he was worried about catching his own umbilical and, you know, catching himself on structures. You know, they didn't know where they were or where the boat was going in that uncontrolled fashion. So it must have been very, they must have been frightening moments for him as well, yeah. How, how deep down were you? Uh, we were 91 metres on the bottom that day, yeah. So what's that in old money, 270 feet, something like that. It's enough, isn't it? My God. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it does. I guess a point with, the, you know, diving, the depth doesn't really make much difference. You know, once you're at a point, the point of no return where the surface isn't an option, you know, 90 metres, 150 metres, it doesn't really make much difference, you know. And so we had Duncan who was managing you guys and he's in the bell and he kept his cool throughout but afterwards you could see it visibly shocked him yeah certainly more than dave who seemed i don't know if cool cucumber is the word or, or sociopath but yeah yeah he gets a bit of a bad rap in the film i think dave yeah he, can, he can, comes across i think they cast us all in a slight role you know the documentary we you know i played sort of the naive new boy which wasn't entirely true and uh, Dave plays sociopath. You're absolutely right. <laughs> he's got a touch of that in him. He's a, he's a very, very lovely man, Dave. You know, and the, uh, we we all felt when we watched the film that he got a bit. He gets painted, you know, quite bad. He gets a lot of abuse online, you know, despite the fact that he's the one who does all the hard work and does the rescuing and <laughs> saves my life. You know, really. Um, I say I say it as a, a an accolade because in that yeah. situation you want someone who's emotionless, who's cool, calm, confident, yeah. and knows what he's doing and is loyal to his dive buddy i mean yeah 100 percent. that's 100 percent right he's exactly what you want you don't want to panic in the water that day and he's not a panicker he was you know it, some of the phrases he's in the film like he's like, i can't remember how he describes it but you know he talks about coming and getting an animal object you know a lot of that's just editing you know we we made a, a, a shorter version of the film prior to the, the main last breath and they uh you know i think he says in that film you know didn't want to treat come and fetch me like coming to fetch a colleague or a friend he wanted to treat it as though he was just picking up an inanimate object because that was easier for him and you know through the beauty of editing he gets slightly misconstrued in the film that he's he's a sort of heartless <laughs> fiend but he's got a bit of that in him and, and as, exactly as you say you, you, you need that and that's what that was for me that was perfect yeah well it's also this you know it, it had you had you have died this guy dave and duncan but you know dave has to live with with this situation for the rest of his life yeah. and earlier you can start compartmentalizing it and rationalizing it and and not going down the emotional route yeah but the, the less programming negative programming you're going to do in your head i mean when 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 lee died on that beach and someone come to inform us that there's a you know yeah they just said get down to the beach and i thought he's dead yeah. That's it. And my mate's going, what are you on about? Don't we shoot? I said, no, he's dead. There's three ambulances, four police cars. Either he's dead or he's, he's killed someone else, right? And that was it. That was just the cut-off switch you might have just went down there, emotionless. Wasn't pleasant, but, you know. Yeah. People, you were die, people die. And, 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 yeah. You know, people die and life still goes on and you've got to live that life. And to have any kind of like permanent trauma if if you have the ability to to not have that yeah that's that's a good thing so it's uh, inter interesting because i think there's different there are i mean you're right i think you're, i personally think you're right i think you have to relativize these things and you and you move on because life does go on and you have to find a way to do that don't you uh, but you know there's also people will argue that you need to sort of i guess talk through things and process them and deal with them but rather than shut them away. But I think that's a slightly, that's a different thing. You know, I think you can still deal with them in your own way without, but you, you know, I think you're absolutely right. You have to process, you have to, uh, you know, for me, it was a case of, you know, I, I'm, I'm not pretending I suffered any trauma because I don't, I don't really feel I did. And weirdly, I think, you, you know, you touched on Duncan being quite upset. Uh, I, I think for, for me, and you might've experienced some of this in your career as well, that, you know, those who had to witness it have suffered far more than those of us who, who went through it certainly from my point of view you know for me it's been a strangely good experience in my life you know it's opened a lot of doors and 
you know, I sort of had the euphoria, and I, I'm unconscious for most of it, of course, you know. <laughs> but those who had to witness that on the screen for sort of, you know, 40 minutes and, and were having a process of the fact that they're going to have to deal with that for the rest of their lives, you know. Um, some of them have suffered, you know, certainly more than, than I have, yeah. Yes, and also, um, you know, you probably want someone thinking they're coming to pick because you, you want them focused. <laughs> you, do, yeah. you know, you don't want them going, oh, God, oh, you know, I mean, they're underwater. They're, they're in incredible danger themselves, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was. It was. A, I think the most remarkable thing about um, the night for me was you, when you were, <clears throat> I listened to sort of the audio, audio recordings of the of dive control and of the bridge. And it's remarkable how calm everybody is, you know, what must have been a horribly stressful situation. Um, you know, they're all very, very professional about everything. And, you know, I don't know whether they went back to the cabins and had a cry, cry afterwards, but at the time, you know, very, very, very calm and professional and, you know, went through all the procedures and everything they, they had to do to, 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 you know, to effect a rescue, really. And it was very, very businesslike, you know. Yes. Remarkable. And I'd imagine probably for the vast majority, it was the, probably the closest they come to a death. Yeah, I'm sure for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is it. I mean, when you watch that footage, you know, in the film, it's, it's like, you know, you see a few minutes of it, but the real thing goes on for sort of 35 minutes and the sort of twitching stops, you know, and I got, and I, then I'm suddenly I'm lying still and that, you know, that they must have assumed the worst. Um, so, you know, you, I don't like to plan it too much because, you know, obviously I'm here and healthy and we're all well and, people suffer horrible traumas and deaths every day. And uh, this wasn't one of those, you know, but for that moment, you know, they, they would have felt that it was. And um, yeah, it definitely had a marked effect on them. Uh, quite a few people that I know. Yeah. And Dave had quite some strength to, to literally drag you all the way back to the bell. Then he had to get you in, into the thing mm. all the time, obviously assuming the worst. I mean, it's, it, uh, people use the term miracle about lots of things, but I mean, this truly was miraculous, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So he, yeah, they were, they sort of lowered the diving bell to a couple of meters off the top of the structure that I was on. And he didn't have that far to pull me up, but, but with the motion of the boat going up and down, I'm, you know, I'm about six foot five and quite, you know, heavier than I should be. Uh, and I had no buoyancy at all, you know, and you can see, you get a bit of that in the film, the sense of how difficult that was for him to drag me back those few metres. And, you know, and there are plenty, I tell you right now, there are plenty who wouldn't have managed it. And he said, it, he said to me himself that, you know, the very last effort to get me onto the bell stage underneath the bell there, if he hadn't got me over on the, on the last go, he, he was, he was spent basically, he had to drop me onto the seabed and, and start again, you know, um, and yeah, so he would have to feed me in, but that's one of the many fine margins because it does, you know, I'm not a particular believer in miracles, but it, it feels miraculous. You know, we, we've got sort of theories and ideas of why uh, I, it's not just surviving for me, it's surviving with, you know, no, no brain damage, you know, or at least no one's been brave enough to tell me otherwise, you know, <laughs> that, that there hasn't been oxygen. You know, you would think 30 minutes with nothing to breathe, at the very least you're going to, you know, the first thing to die, start dying is your, is your brain, you know, from oxygen deprivation, obviously. And um, yeah, to, we, we got away with that as well. You know, there were lots of little fine margins, you know, the fact that Dave was able to get me in there and then helped, obviously. And, um, I've been, you know, I've been down to the Royal Medical Society and spoken there and various hyperbaric conferences and the universal thought, while they don't have a definitive answer as to quite how I survived, is, is that the margins would have been infinitesimally small between you know if not death then certainly you know some kind of some kind of damage you know so yeah it does it feels very much rem uh, miraculous yeah <laughs> i just tell the scientists i'm odd yeah that's just it yeah. <laughs> that's it that's it that's, that's, that's what it is i guess <laughs> but that's just it i'm not i'm really not you know i'm not a i'm not a specimen of any kind you know uh, either mentally or physically you know it's just remarkable that you know us as human beings what we're capable of of surviving you know and um you know it's things like the fact that i would have been hypothermically cold very very quickly and i don't have any memory of that at all you know almost like my body sort of shut down that particular sense because it wasn't necessary or useful at the time you know the body's a remarkable thing isn't it and um yeah i mean we are i always assumed it was the cold it was the principal savior you know almost put me into stasis uh, you know you hear stories of kids don't you falling through ice and surviving underwater for long periods because they've just 
you know, that body shuts down basically. And, you know, in hospitals, they, they, they certainly used to use that a lot, you know, calling patients, calling their blood, you know, everything just to, to shut everything down. But I think the true saviour for me, I think I say that in the film, don't I, was the, the, the gas that we breathe because, you know, we don't breathe air at that depth. We breathe uh, a, he- a heliox mix, so a mixture of helium and oxygen, um, which while the percentage of oxygen is quite low, I think that night the, the normal breathing gas was, I think it was about nine, maybe 9%. I remember now, yeah. Um, but it's a lower percentage than you would breathe on the surface, obviously. But because of the pressures involved, um, we won't bore you with the science, but you know, the, the, the partial pressure means effectively you're breathing higher quantities of oxygen than you would do on a surface. So, uh, and the, the bailout gas has a higher percentage again. So, I think you know, that sort of nine minutes, wherever it was, of, of, of high concentrated oxygen um, or you know, high percentage of oxygen gas saturated my tissues effectively with oxygen and meant that perhaps combined with the cold you know everything shuts down and the cells the individual cells had enough oxygen to to not die basically and um yeah because you had david blaine didn't you you, he 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 went for the world record at holding his breath yeah and by saturating his body first by hyperventilating i I think it was i I think the video is on on youtube yeah. He then was able to hold his breath for, oh my gosh, it was, I don't know, like 20 minutes or something. It was just yeah. incredible. You see free divers kind of do the same. There's a name for it, isn't there? When they do that sort of almost hyperventilating on the surface before they go down. Uh, yeah. Just to, to do, to do the same thing. Yeah. I think just to, to oxygenate the system as much as, as much as possible. So I suppose it was, it was like that, but times 10 really with the, with the gas that I was breathing. So that's the only real logical explanation. You know, it doesn't mean the chances weren't slim, you know, slim and fine, you know, um, yeah. you can see in that, in the, in the, in the footage as well, you can see a water line in my hat, you know, um, which you, know, you assume again was either was below the, the oral nasal and didn't drown me, you know, uh, one thing we, another thing is when we, uh, when Duncan sort of gave me two breaths, you know, just to bring me round, which I, apparently I came around straight away, but I ex- kind of exhaled very, very, it was violently, you know, big violent exhal- exhalation, like my, maybe my tongue had lulled and blocked my, my throat, you know, something like that, which again, might stop water going down it, you know, it's difficult because we don't really know, you know, we're all we're sort of theorizing really, but yeah, I, I think a lot of, while well, we had a big dose of bad luck that night, a lot of things went our and my way obviously afterwards you know so um yeah lucky boy that's for sure i thought he was kissing you um i saw a hashtag on twitter i'm not on twitter at all really but someone someone had a hashtag talking about the film and they called it duncan's magic kiss hashtag duncan's magic kiss <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think i do that at the end of the film don't they it came, it came to my wedding um it came to my wedding i got married a few months later and uh uh he was there and there was, uh, there, was uh, there was another guy there who who was um uh, who uh, is this older guy who lives near me? And I think on a drunken night out, I planted a kiss on him at some point, which he, he had just because he hates it. Uh, yeah, so I think I said that on the day, you know, one of only two people in the room who've given me a decent kiss on the lips, yeah, <laughs> which he hated as well. But yeah, yeah, very grateful to him for, for, for doing it. <laughs> so for me, the without doubt, the best bit, the best bit in the film is just seeing how much they were grinning yeah well once you'd come around and, and they were just smiling and it yeah. just it just said it yeah forget forget dave forget the sociopath thing <laughs> you know that smile just just said it all yeah you can see moments there can't you and that's you know that's you know, that's a lot of the reason the film got made because it's all genuine gen most of you know 99 percent of what they use is genuine footage from the night you know and um yeah, there's some nice moments there. I can. I don't have too many recollections. I can remember reaching over and squeezing Duncan's hand at some point on the way back, uh, and you can, you can see in the footage Dave sort of reaching over and grabbing me as well. So yeah, it's you know it's um, you know I think a lot of the reason why we've all we've all been fine about it really is that we, yeah we had this sort of you know the euphoria of getting away with it really you know we were in a, we were in a great mood when we got, when we all got back because we'd we'd survived you know and um, you know and I'd obviously kept my life, but they, they had, they had sort of escaped having, you know, the tra- sort of traumas you're talking about of having a witness, a friend, you know, a friend, a friend, uh, hopefully a friend anyway, uh, you know, die in front of them and have to carry out the rest of their life. So yeah, it was, yeah, it was, 
as I said, it's been a sort of strangely positive experience for certainly for me, and I think I think for them to some extent as well. You know. So, so how did Duncan feel then when he suddenly realised, oh my God, you're you're alive and you're compass mentors? Yeah, I think he was surprised. Yeah, <laughs> it was. I don't think I don't think anywhere anybody was expecting it at all. Um, uh, yeah, I think he was. He was confused. I think you know Dave talks about it a bit in the film as well. I think doesn't he when he. Uh, how does he talk? He says, um, "Yeah, you remember he coming back, being slightly confused that I was I was sat there alive." You know, I think we were all a bit bemused. You know, I think he references his children, doesn't he? That he was a bit like a bit annoyed with me in some ways. You know, like a, one of his kids had wandered off. So gl- glad that I was alive, but angry with me for having putting him through all that. You know, which is probably fair enough. You know? <laughs> so yeah, I think we we're all yeah yeah surprised. I mean, we we Duncan and I had had a sort of a quite a close relationship you know he'd almost taken a sort of father figure role on for me on the boat in terms of my training and you know we'd we'd we'd, we'd grown quite close before that so I think it was yeah for him more, more than anything it'd be a relief I would I would like to think anyway yeah and what were the implications then for um I won't say the name of the company because they're probably <laughs> fed up with the exposure but the closed now so that's all right yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay but the company that the um you know, made this computer system. Did they? Did their shares sort of plummet? Or, or oh yeah, that? that yeah. So that was a different yeah, different company to mine. But yeah, that's right. So they um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, the, the thing is that system uh, exists on thousands, if not tens of thousands, of boats around the world. So they were obviously concerned about that. They took the system off the boat and back to their yard in uh, in Norway, which is where they're from. Uh, <laughs> they uh, and tried to recreate the fault, you know, mi- uh, a million times over, and we were never able to replicate it um so they sort of you know they've they've put in its software essentially since I, th- I believe to to prevent that ever happening again so they tell me you know um you have to sort of trust it uh, it's a bit above my pay grade um but yeah uh I, yeah i don't know actually yeah i think they probably they're probably cornered the market already so they got away with it you know <laughs> and did you did you get any sort of compensation no no i didn't know i mean i you know people often I think either, either surprise or assume that I, I you know, got some massive payout, but ultimately I didn't have anything to be compensated for. I didn't feel, you know, I, I I'm sure if I'd have said, Oh, I can't go back to work, they would have had to, but, um, you know, my concerns at the time, I didn't, that didn't even cross my mind. You know, I felt I was well and healthy and I was kind of in the infancy of that part of my career. So my concern, which probably suited them in, you know, in hindsight was just to get back to work and keep my job really, you know, um, so no, I didn't. No, I think I got a T-shirt at some point. I remember, I remember getting called into the boss's office. I did a couple of talks with him afterwards, you know. And he, I remember him saying, "Well, we did a bit of a practice run through. Oh, we need to, we need to do something for Chris. We need to do something for Chris." And I thought, "Oh, here we go. Here come the keys to the Range Rover, you know." And he took me into his office, and uh, I think I got a T-shirt and a little bag. Or something. <laughs> Thanks very much. You know, you probably just don't bother next time. Yeah, but you know, in, in honesty, I. I you know, it'd be nice to be sat on a beach in the Caribbean and all that, uh, not working. But um, I, to be I would, honest, there, um, it, it would just be an omission of guilt on their part, wouldn't it? And then, well, and exactly, that, exactly. That yeah. just opens up a lawsuit for for millions, and they're not worried about the millions; they're worried about the damage to their reputation, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure my attitude suited them as well. That. But, you know, I would have done it either way. I, I didn't really, um, you know, I don't like to be dishonest, I suppose. And that would, for me, to put in any kind of claim would have been a dishonest one because it, I was fine. I felt I could work. I didn't feel traumatised by the experience. So, um, yeah, um, that ship sailed now. I might, it, might, it might be different now, yeah, with kids and everything to pay for. So. <laughs> but I'm glad I did what I did. You know, I feel like I kept my integrity and, and rather than go down this, you know, I, look, if I'd been injured or I felt like I couldn't work, then that's a different matter, isn't it? That's what, for me, compensation is there for. And, you know, um, but you know, it would have been a dishonest one for me. Mm. Yeah. And can you tell us a bit, because one of my, my buddies, I've known him many, many years now, he's former Marine too, and went on to work in the North Sea. Yeah. And he tells me lots of stories about it. He says, sometimes, Chris, you, you fuck something up on the seafloor and you, yeah, you worry about it for ages, and then like nobody ever finds it. <laughs> I shouldn't be probably shouldn't be saying this, but um, but he said when you're in the when you're in the chamber, the diving bell, you you 
you, you, or, or is it the decompression chamber when you're back on the ship? I'm not. I'm, it's probably the decompression chamber back on the ship. I'm guessing. He yeah. said, but you're speaking this squeaky voice, and he said, if if you have eggs, they're all like really flat. Is, yeah. Is this true? Yeah. So um, yeah. So basically, you I think people people sort of think I think people think you live on the seabed, but you don't. You, you're absolutely right. You live in these decompression chambers on the boat. So on sort of day one of your trip, you'll you'll go in, they'll close the door, and then you and the whole system is pressurized down. Um, so gas is pumped into basically an equivalent working depth. So if you're going to be working at ninety meters, then the the system is probably pressurized down to about 85 or something like that. So that means that every day when the diving bell locks on and you climb up um, and you, you get sealed away from the system and lowered down in the bell to 85 meters, when you open the door, you've got an equivalence of pressure inside and out. Water doesn't come in because of that. And so you've got a dry environment down on the 85 meters and you get out, you dive, you put your kit on, you dive the last sort of five or 10 meters down to the seabed, work for six hours and then come back and, go back to the system. And what, what that really means is you're never decompressing. And that's what saturation diving is essentially really is that you are basically doing one very long, uh, we're limited to 28 days in the North Sea. So you're doing one long 28 day dive and you just decompress at the, the last sort of four or five days because that's how long it takes to decompress from that depth. Um, you do that in the sort of the safety of the of the system, lying in your bunk, reading a bed, a uh, book, basically, as the as the gas is very slowly let out. So yeah, so that you spend most of your time, as you say, living in those chambers, and that's the that's probably the most difficult bit of the job. Actually, the diving is a sort of the relief, you know, but living in that environment where you're under pressure and you're living in very close confines with you know eleven other men is 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 probably the harder bit of the job. So yeah, you're right because you're under pressure um everything has to be locked in and out with through uh, through locks basically so uh, you know air locks or gas locks um so you know when we want when we want food we have to take a menu off and that has to be passed out and your food gets passed in on a little silver tray and um yeah so anything with bubbles or or air pockets is compressed you know so if you were to pass a bag of towels in um with and you don't puncture the bag just a little plastic bag that that bag of towels will come in the gas will be compressed and you could probably kill somebody with it you know it's like a rock when it comes in and equally more dangerous is when you put things out if you forget to take the lid off something you know let's say a jar of coffee and you you know you send it out with a lid on in the you know the gas in there will expand as it comes out rapidly and it will explode so yeah it's a funny place to live uh you know you have to you're on camera all the time. You have to uh, ask permission to, you know, have the toilet flushed and that kind of thing. It's, uh, yeah, it's a strange place to live. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you do exercise down there? A little bit. Yeah. We, um, so you're obviously exercising when you're diving, it's, you know, you're, you're, on, you're working for six hours. So that's your exercise for the day really. But yeah, we keep a few weights in there and uh, you're really supposed to avoid exercising when you're decompressing, you know, it's not encouraged. So, uh, but yeah, it's a long time for people to be in there and not do anything. So we, um, yeah, we used to have an exercise bike in there. I don't think it's in there anymore, but yeah, you can, you can do a little bit. Yeah. Do you have, um, do you have like videos and DVDs and stuff or is, yeah, we do these days. We do. You can, we sort of have a TV that can be beamed in through a porthole. Uh, yeah, that's what I thought. We've got screens. We do have screens now that can survive in there, yeah. So we can get a bit of TV, a very, very poor internet sometimes. So you can, you can sort of uh, do a little bit. But yeah, you take in, you take in plenty of books and plenty of movies and uh, and talk a lot of rubbish. <laughs> when you're doing your public speaking, Chris, what's the what's the most often thing that people, the audience, ask you? Uh, people. Yeah, I get from real stand-up people. They, they want to know about the practical side of, of it. You know, you touched on there. So, you know, how you get your toilet flushed and how you get fed. But in terms of the incident, people come in three categories. I think they sort of, there are the, there's the religious contingent who want to know if I saw the light, uh, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, people want to know how I survived, you know, and I don't really have an answer, a really good answer for that either. Um, and, you know, and people often want to know, I get a lot of people who've suffered, like, you know, have suffered real trauma or who've lost people um, and they, they feel that maybe, which and I, I don't really, you know, have some insight into death, you know, as I've, as I've, you know, as I've looked it in the eye and come back. Um, and I always feel a little bit guilty about answering that because, like I said, I don't like to ham up what I went through and pretend that I've suffered something that I haven't just for the sake of, you know, showmanship or whatever. But, 
you know, I get people who just who just looking for comfort a lot of the time and, and you know, a word of reassurance that the process of death, which for me, you know, not that I didn't die, but you know what I mean, that process of the last minutes were, were not desperately unpleasant and the passing over into unconsciousness wasn't an unpleasant experience. If that had been my death, then it wasn't a terrible way to go. So, you know, you're able to offer a little bit of reassurance to some people and, um, yeah, which is nice, you know, I suppose. And what's this with Empire magazine? Three stars. What's all that about? It's a disgrace, isn't it? I don't see that. I'm not sure I've seen that one. It's a three star review. What, three out of five? I'm, I'm hoping it's five. Better not be bloody ten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, they mostly got really good reviews, but uh, yeah, there's one or two. I don't know. It's a matter of taste, isn't it? I suppose. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, it's weird. I, I I find it hard to judge the film. I think when I when I first saw it, I have to admit, I didn't. I wasn't really that keen on it. I think because you hyper analyze because you're in it. And let's be totally honest. You're only worried about how you come across. You know, do I come across all right? <laughs> so uh, there was a couple of bits in the film I wasn't. I thought, well, I don't like that. And the way it's edited doesn't sound naturally like me speaking. But I've seen it so many times now. I've grown to. I've grown quite fond of it. And you realise what they were trying to do with everything. And your you know, bum, your bum looked a bit a bit yeah. big in that suit. Yeah, you know. exactly, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly that. But yeah, it seems to. It seems you know. I get. I still get messages, you know, on a daily basis, really, from people who've seen it, and you know, they seem to. They seem to be universally positive, and people seem to. Yeah, it's an emotional experience, isn't it? They either like it for different reasons, I guess. But yes, for, for any for our friends at home, I'll put a link below so you can get a copy of the the um, the DVD. Um, it, you probably get fed up with being asked this, but are you going to write a book, Chris, or is <laughs> Yeah, do you know, yeah, I, I am actually, yeah. Um, people don't ask me that, but yeah, I, 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 I sort of ummed and ahed about it for a while. Again, I didn't really want to, I don't want to make too much of it, but I quite like writing anyway. So yeah, there's there's one in the in the pipeline, I suppose. Yeah, whether it gets published or not, it's a different matter. But um, yeah, we've got a few people interested. So hopefully, watch this space, yeah. Yeah, if I can help you with that at all, feel, you know, you've only got to ask, mate. Of, uh... well, very kind. Well, I think when it when it comes out, I'll be. I suppose I'll be. I'll be. Uh, the shoe will be in the other foot. I'll be trying to sell it, won't I? So <laughs> yeah, that's so... friends. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to our world. Eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That is. <laughs> yes. And so, final thing, Chris. What What do we learn by this? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what do we learn? I. <laughs> I don't like I said. I don't feel I've had any epiphany, you know. And we've we've learned at work. We learned you know, practical things through 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 what happened. We've we've changed a few things at work that we uh, we learned through the experience of having to rescue somebody. Um, what we found the biggest sort of the biggest thing we learned, I guess, and that's applicable to other people, was that we felt we we felt we knew everything about rescuing people so we do it with something that's a drill that we do all the time. Um, and yet we still found things out on that night that we'd never, we'd never learned before. So what we realized was that our drills were, was, you know, we felt were pretty good. We're uh, not real. We weren't realistic enough. You know, we weren't uh, doing it as if it was the real thing and uh, people were helping people to rescue them, you know, for that, that sort of thing. So um, yeah, realism in our drills is probably the biggest, biggest lesson we learned on a, you know, a broader picture since that night but yeah in terms of um human beings and all that you know what, what remarkable things we are i think is what you learn isn't it that we can survive all sorts of things and um um i, I would say don't give up you know and, and on yourself at any point because there is uh, it's remarkable what we can extricate ourselves from you know mentally and physically isn't it so um yeah and embrace life because it can it can be cut off at any point as we all as we all know how long do you think you'll keep diving for I've just stopped actually. Yeah, I stopped this year. Um, so I've, I've, I've transferred to, to, I'm training to be a, a supervisor. So the role of the guy in the film, Craig, Craig was the supervisor that night. So I now sit in a comfy chair and uh, try and try and tell the others what to do, including Duncan, which is ridiculous because, you know, he's far more experienced than I am. But that's, that's one of the tricky bits of the job. Yeah. Telling people who are probably better at their job than you are how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so that's it. I've, I've, I've stopped now, I think. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, Folks at home, if you want to book this incredible gentleman for public <laughs> speaking, I'll put a link for, for Chris's website below. Thank you. Uh, or a Zoom, Zoom, a Zoom chat. Um, yeah. Don't be shy. 
uh, because what just what an amazing, amazing story. Chris, stay on the line so I can thank you properly when I hit the record button off. But for the purposes of the tape, massive thank you, mate. It's just I thoroughly enjoyed this chat. No, me too. It's been a real, you know, it's real, really kind that people are interested in the story. So thank you. And thanks for your time. Yes, I've, I've wow. enjoyed it as well. Welcome. To our friends, oh, massive love to you all. Please look after yourselves. If you can chuck us a like, a share and a subscribe, that would be wonderful. And we'll see you next time.